Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of In Conversation Live uh, from the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm Roger Kirby. I'm the uh, current president uh, of the RSM, and uh, we've got another great guest for you this evening, James Badenock, QC, son of the late Sir John Badenock, who was Director of Clinical Studies and Dean of the Medical School at Oxford University. James is described as a renegade from a far-flung medical dynasty. He's a pupil to uh, John Elliott and um, Lord Wolfe at Crown Office Row, where he's practiced for many years. He specializes in clinical negligence, medical law and professional discipline. He took silk in 1989, and he's listed for many years in the principal directors as one of the most foremost practitioners in the fields of clinical negligence, professional discipline and personal injury. So welcome, uh, James. Lovely to speak to you. Thanks very much uh, for talking to the, us at the RSM. We've got 100, 840 people registered this evening, and I bet we get lots of questions. Questions are welcome. Please do send them in, and uh, we'll try and ask, answer at least some of them uh, for you. Well, we'll put them to James, and he can do the answering, I guess. So, James, let, let's start off with a bit of background for, for you and the famous Badenock family. I, I looked up Badenock, actually. I found it was the drowned land um, in the in the Cairngorms. So I guess it's a Scottish family originally, the Badenocks, but very distinguished and mainly medical. Tell, tell us a little bit about your family and, and about why you sort of were the renegade, as, as, as you describe yourself. <laughs> Well, it, it is uh, on both sides of my family. It's almost entirely medical. Father, grandfather, two great uncles, four uncles, seven cousins, and about six children of those cousins. That's on both sides of the family. Yes, it's a Scottish family. The Wolf of Badenoch was the biggest villain of Scots history. Uh -huh. Rightly hanged in about 1500. <laughs> my grandfather fled from Scotland and became a doctor in uh, London. Uh, my father was purebred Scot by blood, but born and raised in London and the South, and became a distinguished doctor at the Radcliffe in Oxford, although on the way he trained, studied at Oxford, then in, I think at the London, and then he was a Rockefeller a scholar or fellow at the Cornell Medical Center in New York, and only came back to fight the war. Mm -hmm. so, so medical were my family that my mother told me that when I was a little boy, I used to say, when I grow up, when I'm a doctor, because I thought that when you grew up, you were a doctor. <laughs> it was <laughs> and your uncle was Sir Alec Badenoch, president of the Royal College of Surgeons, whose uh, son David is a colleague of mine and a, a member of the Royal Society of Medicine, president of the urology section, actually, quite a few years ago. But David's a great chap. Um, so, so uh, w what made you, what, when did you realise that actually medicine wasn't for you and that, that the law beckoned, as it were? Well, my, my father um, was really a true workaholic. He worked seven days a week. We had to live next door to the hospital. He was regularly called out in the middle of the night. And when I asked one of his senior registrars, why do you call him out in the middle of the night so often? He replied, because he doesn't mind. And he was wedded to medicine and to his work. And I, I wasn't totally enamored of that lifestyle. It seemed to me it didn't leave much room for other interests or hobbies or, and so on. But the real reason I think I didn't follow him uh, was that I was <laughs> rather good at Latin and Greek, which in those days was, was something that uh, <laughs> was considered the right way to educate boys. And I didn't enjoy science at all. So that was really the nail in the coffin of any aspirations I might have had to follow my father. Well, I mean, we've got three questions already. Um, uh, uh, we, let's go straight in, actually. Eleanor Platt says, um, QC says, great to see you. Uh, thank you, Eleanor. Um, Michael Robinson says, does the judiciary appreciate the resource implications of informed consent? I mean, I think that's, that's obviously a, a reference to the Montgomery case, one of your more famous cases, Montgomery versus Lanarkshire. Should, should we should we start with that? And and uh, because I mean, I, as a surgeon myself, well, a retired surgeon these days, um, you know, the, the time taken to given to give the sort of informed consent that is now necessary uh, does take up a load more time and effort. But you know, I feel that that, that is justified. Not everybody does. So t talk us through that case. 
because not everybody knows. I mean, obviously, you know more about it than probably anybody else in the world, apart from maybe Mrs. Montgomery herself. But can you can you describe that case and the implications of it? Yeah, well, the facts can be quite briefly stated. Mrs. Montgomery was about five foot one. She was in her first pregnancy. She was a long-standing insulin-dependent diabetic, and her great risk, of course, was of a macrosomic, excessively grown fetus. Uh, she was a graduate in um, molecular physics. She was highly intelligent. She was very concerned as the baby grew bigger and bigger, and she was tiny. And it, um, she asked on a number of occasions about the risks of vaginal delivery and was given no information whatsoever. She was um, monitored in the most exceptional way every two weeks ultrasounds which showed this fetus growing ever bigger and bigger. Uh, when she did try and ask if there were any special risks, uh, all that she was told was that if there was a problem during labour, uh, they would go to cesarean section. The big problem, of course, with the macrosomic babies is the possibility of shoulder dystocia when the head comes out and the shoulder is stuck behind the symphysis pubis. And they were told her absolutely nothing about that risk. Um, she obviously wanted to have a cesarean section because she was very, very nervous about this baby getting bigger and bigger. Um, what transpired, of course, was that she had uh, labour imposed upon her, literally, by induction. She had no choice, she was given no information, no advice about alternatives, no suggested um, elective cesarean section. So in effect, she was driven inexorably to this um, labor by induction. And when um, it became predictably obstructed, they didn't go to cesarean section at a time when they still could have done. Uh, and of course they forced the thing on with syntocin on and the baby eventually head out, shoulder stuck. Tremendous difficulty getting that baby out. Indeed, the female obstetrician, Dr. McClellan, uh, tried to sever the symphysis pubis, which is used in the third world when they haven't got operating facilities, uh, rather than a cesarean section, because by then it's too late to do a section. Um, although I think there's a thing called the Zeffinelli maneuver where you push the baby right back up into the womb, but they don't do it really. Um, uh, by the time they got him out, he had suffered the risk of which is a well-known one, of brachial plexus lesion, uh, but he was also a, a suffering from quite severe sexual brain damage, having been a perfectly normal, full-grown, admittedly large fetus, who had there been an elective section would have been born perfectly normally. Yeah. When asked what she wanted, Mrs. Montgomery said she would have wanted an elective section. Mrs. Dr. McLennan said she didn't offer elective cesarean section, because in her opinion, cesarean section was not, as she put it, in the maternal interest. Mm -hmm. uh, she had deprived the mother of any information whatsoever about the risks or the alternatives. That was defended in Scotland by experts who said, no, perfectly reasonable not to tell her about any of the risks. And the judges agreed, perfectly reasonable. Um, most people uh, who have anything to do with maternity would not agree with those judges. Um, and certainly as a matter of law, it did seem extraordinary, even under the old law as it existed, she should have been given the information. Um, sure. And um, so, of course, the, the case was a ripe one for uh, trying to attack the old principle, which was provided at least some doctors will support what you did or didn't tell the patient, then it's perfectly all right and there's no negligence involved. Mm. And of course, you and I know that there's always a variety of opinions. And it was apparently relatively easy to find a couple of obstetricians who said, no, perfect reason not to tell her anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what, those are the factual matrix which, which led to the change in the law. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and do, do you think that that has been beneficial for the patient, that they get more information? The, uh, people probably agree with that, don't they? No, that's the current position that... I mean, I, I remember at the time, it was, what, 2016 or something, wasn't it, where the shockwaves ran through the profession because we're going to have to spend so much more time explaining things to patients. But, uh, you know, in this age of information, um, it's surely got to be the right thing. So so I, I think that... Uh, uh, but what John Rudd here is saying, what, are your, what does the learned speaker say about no-fault compensation as a New Zealand model? Because billions are wasted every year in the NHS on legal costs. So do you, what are your thoughts about that suggestion? Well, of course, I have 
uh, you would say he would say this anyway, wouldn't he? But uh, no fault insurance vaguely works in New Zealand with a population of, I think, six million less than the population of London. But they have endless disputes about whether uh, the incident which led to the courts was, in fact, a medical accident, which means compensation, or was it instead simply the natural course of the disease process, no compensation. So in New Zealand, the lawyers are still very busy, obviously. Um, the real problem with no fault compensation is this country couldn't afford it, given the number of unfortunate outcomes in medical care. Either it would be grotesquely too expensive for the state to bear, or it would have to be the subject of compensation grossly inadequate compared to the compensation you get if you're injured in another, in another context. So that, I mean, I don't want to have to tell a client that it, he better go out and get paralyzed again uh, by a drunken driver when he'll get full compensation. When uh, having been paralyzed by a drunken or care very careless surgeon, uh, that surgeon is in a very unique position and can't be sued. Yeah. Uh, also, tort law has a vital function in our society. In, in terms of, 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 of preventing negligent uh, activities in medicine and, and beyond, you mean, yeah? Well, it reminds everyone of the need to take the greatest care. Yeah. It, leads, it leads to the taking of all possible steps to protect people from harm. And the expensive cost of it is, of course, entirely due uh, or largely due to the number of unacceptable mistakes. I mean, the anger that's directed at the lawyers or indeed at the claimants seems to me to be um, a distorted attitude when you consider that um, the reason they get their damages is that the, the courts have ruled or it's been admitted that a mistake was made that was so bad that no reasonable doctor professing the relevant skill acting with ordinary care would have made. Mm -hmm. so why don't, why isn't the anger and the vociferous complaints directed at the mistakes that are made, the number of serious mistakes? Yeah. Rather than the lawyers for doing the job that after all they're supposed to do under our legal system. And do you, do you think that, I mean, legal costs are rising. People talk about a tsunami of legal costs. I mean, is that because more mistakes are being made or is it because that, you know, that the, the amount of compensation being paid is skyrocketing too? Well, the compensation, um, the amounts of compensation have indeed gone up over the years, partly due to the multiplier, which is the thing on which you base future, the computation of future losses. Um, a lump sum paid today will run out unless it's computed adequately to last for the lifetime of the person who needs the, the care or whatever it is. So two things happen. One is they decided to have periodical payments. So you only get paid by the defendant for as long as you need it. And when you die, it stops. But the other thing is, unfortunately, the returns on invested money are so low now that the lump sum to cover the rest of your life has to be ever increasingly large. Mm -hmm. um, but but the, 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 the thing about the legal costs, it's, it's very odd, you know, I just want to make one point, which is, I used to do both sides. And then in my later career, I've always done claimant work. We used to call them plaintiffs. <laughs> Don't know why we had to change that. That was Harry Wolf. Um, when a claimant's lawyer acts for a claimant in a clinical negligence case, it's under no win, no fee. If he doesn't win, he gets no pay at all for all his work. That is not true of defence lawyers. Defence lawyers gets paid regardless. And so far as the solicitors who do defence work is concerned, it's no secret, they're paid significantly higher rates for defending cases than they are for settling them. Mm. Uh, the, unfortunately, therefore, there is a very considerable incentive, which has been my experience, to defend the indefensible for a long time, thus running up huge costs on the defence side which shouldn't be run up at all in many instances because the case should have been settled simply, quickly and relatively cheaply at the outset. Yeah. And if it's alleged that claimant lawyers are to blame for all this, if they don't win the case, they get literally zero pay, whereas the defence lawyers get paid regardless. Mm -hmm. So, so I, you can tell that I have a certain resistance to the complaint about lawyers and the law being to blame for damages. What's to blame for it is the making of unacceptable mistakes in very large numbers. Yeah, and that 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 brings us on to the to the question of whether resource there's enough resources to to fund an NHS that is error free that can be 
error free. I mean, it's never going to be completely error free. But if, if the you know the real estate of hospitals is falling down around you and there's uh, uh, rotation, um, absent people from the rotation and uh, everybody's worn out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, then of course more mistakes are going to be made. But we do seem to be seeing a lot more mistakes, don't we? I mean, in urology, I think we've got you know, an exponential rise in, in mistakes. I, I just saw a graph showing the, the number of cases in urology skyrocketing, and that, that must just be a re reflection of other specialties as well. Well, well let, me, let me say straight away, coming from a medical family, uh, the real cause, the fundamental cause against which anger and political thought should be directed is the underfunding of the NHS, the understaffing of the NHS, the, the failure of successive generations to restore and boost the morale of the medical profession, which is, I have observed the morale of the profession sinking ever lower. So underfunding, understaffing, under-resourcing, all these things, we, we, have, we spend less per capita on healthcare in this country than France or Germany and other countries. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we are not tackling the root causes of these mistakes, which are the things you mentioned and I've just, yeah. yeah. And what's more, of course, uh, I want to add a couple of other things before perhaps we should move on, but um, the cost of the legal costs and damages is roughly 1% of the uh, 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 total funding of the NHS, the turnover, you might call it turnover. That's far, far less than a commercial institution of a similar size would be paying in the, in the market for insurance from the companies that provide it. Far one percent of turnover is much less for liability insurance than those uh, institutions and companies will be paying in the open market. And finally, another point: obesity. The figures published not very long ago show that the cost of illness due to obesity is certainly double that of the legal costs and damages paid out. So yeah. there, are, there, are, there are things which ought to be the, the subject of concern. Greater. Sure. Than sure. It makes it a lot more difficult for us to operate on when patients are very obese, that's for sure. Now, now I think, you know, that we're, we're, I want this to be a sort of um, a masterclass in medico-legal issues. And, and, and some of the cases um, that you've appeared in are, have been pretty seminal uh, over the years. And actually, Richard Valance is asking about the Wilshire case. Uh, I know that's an important case. Um, and why was that, that case important? Can you tell us that? Um, well, Wilshire, just very quickly, concerned uh, what used to be called retrolental fibroplasia or retinopathy of prematurity. A little boy was born a bit, somewhat prematurely, and as we all know, those premature babies often need oxygen to support their lungs. It was in the early days, I think, before they gave a lot of those drugs to support the um, respiration. Uh, I forgot what the drug's called now, but. Um, also, the mother had, had no warning that he was about to be born prematurely because she was one of the rare women who don't have labor pains. Uh, anyway, they, they put the catheter to monitor blood oxygenation into the umbilical vein by mistake, negligent mistake. They shouldn't have done that, uh, rather than the umbilical artery. Uh, and therefore, they pumped him full of oxygen, which was known or believed to be a cause of this strange form of blindness in the premature. Um, they were getting a, a reading from the vein and therefore kept on pumping more and more and more oxygen into him. It was a dangerous thing to do, even in the state of knowledge of the, of the day. And it was held that they should have observed the fact that they were put the monitor in the vein, not the artery. And a number of issues arose. Um, what was the standard of care for a junior doctor? Because he had put it in the wrong um, a vessel and it was held that uh, he, he, he had to perform to the standard of the procedures which he was carrying out but that in fact his seniors he should have been able to have adequate help from his seniors he asked for it and his mistake was not checked or rectified so that was negligent provision of excess oxygen to this little boy who became blinded by the uh, condition known as retro, now known as retinopathy of prematurity. And it was a very important case because the, the, the law laws discussed all the features which uh, amount to what the law calls negligence in the clinical context. And um, the case went all the way, went from 
the original trial judge who was on a bit of frolic of his own and found for the claimant on an unjustified basis, although legally he could have found the claimant perfectly normally. Then to the Court of Appeal who retried it in the Court of Appeal and found for the claimant on the legitimate basis. And then from there to the Supreme Court, as it now called the House of Lords, where the Law Lord said, no, the Court of Appeal shouldn't have done that. It should go back for trial by a different judge. Um, so it was a huge case that went on through all our courts and um, echoed down the years. Yeah, there's quite an interesting comment here from, um, it must be a patient, Catherine Budget Meekin. Catherine said she, she had a long and uh, difficult and, and damaging shoulder operation. And she said, if the hospital had said sorry, and then this is what we're going to do about the damage, I wouldn't have approached my solicitor. But after three years, she did get paid out. But she, she's asking why, uh, you know, sh should should hospitals and doctors who, who make mistakes, errors, um, whether they're negligent or whether they're just inadvertent errors, sh should they admit and say sorry earlier? Um, and would that reduce the number of cases going to court, do you think? Um I don't think it would necessarily reduce the cases, for example, of cerebral palsy children who need sometimes 24 hour care and all special equipment. I can't see that an apology would necessarily um, obviate claims on that child's behalf. But I can tell you that in, in my many, many years at the bar, 50 years, the number of times I heard that, if only they told me what had gone wrong, if only they'd said they were sorry about it, I wouldn't have gone to a lawyer. Yeah. But I certainly in the lesser cases, and I'm quite convinced that the duty of candor, as it's now called, is in the end going to reduce the number of people who have recourse to lawyers in the desperation of wanting to know what on earth happened. And sometimes the bitterness and anger because nobody sat down with them and explained things and also perhaps where necessary said they were very sorry. Yeah. And it, I, one of my friends um, is Ian Erdley. He's now CEO of the, um, uh, of the MDU. And I know if he were... Um, if he, he might be listening, but uh, whether he is or not, I know he'd, he'd say, please write clearly in the notes, you know, the plan that you're going to undertake and what you actually did. I mean, would you, would you, how many cases um, hang on the fact that doctors haven't recorded what they've done uh, or, uh, uh, or, or done so inadequately? Well, the first thing to, to know is that it, as a matter of law, absence of evidence is not in fact evidence of absence. Mm -hmm. so the fact that you didn't make a note of something it does not mean the judge will automatically conclude that it wasn't done or didn't happen. But equally, when, when these events which come to be discussed in a court hearing much later on are simply part of your job and the patient was yet another patient among perhaps hundreds and hundreds of patients, your recollection may be greatly assisted by careful and properly written notes even notes that explain when things went wrong and why they went wrong. Uh, because yeah. it just has to remember, of course, that it's not every mistake or bad outcome which is held to be negligent. It, it has to be a mistake so bad that no reasonable doctor acting with ordinary skill and care would have made it. Um, and your notes are a good resource when you have to look back on one of many cases I know you all remember your absolute disasters, no doubt you remember them quite well. But you don't necessarily remember all those many routine cases, some of which will turn out to have had a bad outcome. Yeah, yeah. It's very important, very important. Yeah. Well, and, don't, and don't alter them after the event. I mean, there's one doctor uh, that I know that ended up in prison for a year because he'd, he'd sort of tampered with the notes after the event in a, in a fatal case, actually, where something had gone wrong. So that's that's pretty important. Uh, that, let's talk about another case, um, Lily White versus UCLH. Um, that, that's quite an interesting case, isn't it, uh, to, to discuss. Tell us about that, James. Yes, it, it was. A, it was an extraordinary case, really. The, the ultrasonographer, the first port of call in the pregnant woman for examination of the uh, integrity of the fetus and all its component parts, um, was very worried because when she studied the fetal brain uh, in a very anxious mother, I should say, uh, she reckoned that three vital components of the brain were actually missing. She therefore referred the case onward and upward. And it went via a private uh, ultrasonographer obstetrician specialist who admittedly, and in his own defense, 
said he didn't get a very good view of this baby's uh, in his scan. And it then went to the great um, Pranjandram, uh, the leading proponent of obstetric ultrasound at, at the hospital. And I'm afraid that he not only identified and found all three components, but he actually measured one of them. And um, when the child was born, of course, it was proved beyond any doubt whatsoever, as was agreed and admitted, that those three components were indeed altogether missing from the fetal brain. The defense was odd. First of all, they wrote to us on behalf of, by the way, the child, as you can imagine, was extremely damaged and extremely limited and needed, well, effectively 24 hour care for the whole of her life. And she lived on until she was seven, 16, 17. Mm. Um, the defense was odd. First of all, the defense solicitors wrote to us saying we should abandon the claim at once because we hadn't got a leg to stand on and there was no case to make at all. Secondly, the defense was, which I always thought, and so did the Court of Appeal when we got there, very odd, which was that, of course, he was able to identify and even measure the missing parts because there must have been precisely mimicking echoes for every single one of those three missing parts, which does, in our submission, as we made to the court, stretch coincidence a very, very, very long way that the three missing components had precisely mimicking echoes, each of them in separate parts of the brain. Um, the, the defense was that that was the case, that they must have been visible on echoes. The echoes were obviously mimicked them precisely. And therefore there was no negligence in identifying and measuring things that weren't there. Um, the, the, I, I cut a long story short. Uh, it, the case was lost at trial. And I was on a no win, no fee. So of course, uh, a case that had taken me hundreds, in fact, possibly even more than hundreds of hours of work, uh, I was not going to get paid one single penny, although the defense lawyers all were getting paid, of course. Um, but I, I must say, I thought the, the judge's decision at first instance was so bizarre that he in effect found that we'd not proved that, that um, <laughs> identifying totally missing items on the basis of allegedly precisely mimicking echoes was a credible thing. Uh, we appealed it and my, well, the case was won on appeal and the ironic part of the, the appeal court's decision was that the appeal court judges, um, uh, two out of the three of them, uh, ruled that the case should have been uh, the subject of an admission at an early stage. Indeed, they said that in fact then there uh, judicial ruling view was that there was in fact no de no defense at all to this case and it shouldn't have been defended. So there we had a case where we were asked to abandon immediately at the beginning because we didn't have a case. But the three judges in the court, two out of the three judges in the court of appeal said rather the reverse. Mm, mm. <laughs> There's a question from, from Peter McDonald, Pedro we call him, he's a colorectal surgeon, um, a buddy of mine. Um, I'll just read it out and then I'm going to ask you a slightly different question actually. He says, well, it's a comment more than a question, he says with one third of the cost of neurosurgery operations in the NHS being put aside for compensation today and these costs rising about 5% per annum, at what point will services become par paralysed? So it's a, it's a question about the cost of litigation but um the other sort of um, bugbear of peter mcdonald is that that is the 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 quality of medical uh, experts in court and uh, i suppose in, in, in writing as well i mean quite a few of my friends write an awful lot of medical reports they get paid quite well for doing so and they they seem to really like doing it but is the quality always good and and and, and can you shop around for an expert who's going to say the the thing you want them to say, uh, and if that's the case, is is that do you think that's is that uh, right and proper? Uh, claimants can almost never shop around at all. Legal aid is extremely strict on the number of experts you enlist, and if you don't like the first one's opinion, they're very very reluctant and almost never give you any funding for another expert. Defence can shop around as much as they like until they find an expert who agrees with the defence of the case. So. Shopping around, which may perhaps be a rare event for a claimant if they're very wealthy and they can afford to go and pay out of their own pocket for an expert, but most claimants can't. Um, yeah. Claimants are very restricted in shopping for experts, not yeah. so dependents who can 
keep looking until they find someone who defends them. Well, and, and I mean, the, the, the reason that Peter got uh, agitated about, and I did too, actually, about the quality of medical experts was the David Selu case. And I, and I know you know, you know about that. And actually, David's been on this uh, show about six, six to eight months ago. Um, so you know, gross negligence manslaughter. Let, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, that that really sent shockwaves through the profession. You remember we had some some um, a lot of agitated doctors uh, and quite agitated judges, actually. So what, what, what are your thoughts about gross negligence manslaughter? Should, should doctors really risk going to prison for the mistakes they make? Um, do you know, as far as I know, Dr. Mr. Sello, for whom I have the greatest sympathy, was one of the very, very, very few who have ever actually been sent to prison. Mm -hmm. gross negligence manslaughter. It's mm -hmm. almost unheard of that a doctor convicted of gross negligence manslaughter goes to prison, and rightly so, in my opinion. Um, I, I, I think there are a number of problems with gross negligence manslaughter. First of all, what does it do? It, 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 it panders, if you like, to the public sense that some, something must be done about the tragic events when patients die when they shouldn't have died. Uh, it panders to the public wish for retribution, if you like. The other thing that it does, I suppose, which might be thought to be the right thing, it, it, apart from reflecting society's disapprobation of extremely serious mistakes which end in death, is it does mean that such events are the subject of very thorough and extremely detailed public exploration investigation in open court which usually in death cases by bad mistakes is not so in a civil case because the case will be settled. If mm -hmm. the mistake was very, very bad yeah. for death, it's not going to come to a public hearing, so you'll get no judicial inquiry. And as you know, coroner's inquests in, are limited in the scope of what they look at, what was the cause of death. So those are the possible reasons why these cases are brought. The other one, finally, I suppose, is that if a schoolmaster takes his kids on some madcap kayaking expedition through rough seas and mad currents without life jackets and one of them drowns, uh, gross negligence manslaughter would seem to most people a very sensible charge. And yeah. why should doctors be uh, immune from it? Mm -hmm. The problems with it are that it's defined in such a vague way. It's a crime if the jury think the mistake was so very severe that it went beyond ordinary negligence and becomes a crime. Yeah. Extraordinarily vague thing. And yeah. the, the other problem, I think, is, as you've identified, expert evidence. Uh, there is a deference to experts in court. Juries tend to think, oh, he's a doctor, he's a surgeon, he must know what he's talking about. And sometimes there are either single issue fanatics or very strongly prejudiced uh, members of the healthcare professions who either have it in for an individual or have it in for a particular sort of practice. And the danger of that, that is that you may end up with a very strong, apparently very strong and impressive expert in court, convinces a jury beyond all doubt, but with whom an awful lot of doctors would not agree. But that, yeah. I think, is partly where the defence ought to marshal their defence adequately and deal with it properly, as I've just suggested. Yeah, well, I think that was the case in, in David Sully's case. Um, Catherine Royce says, it seems that individual doctors are being blamed for institutional failings, um, uh, including the David Sully case. But she says, how can trust and private hospitals be held to account when, you know, the problem is a systems error due to the, to the system more than the individual, but the individual is the one that gets sued. What, what are your thoughts about that? Um, the, the case that I was concerned in many years ago was called Doctors Misra and Suravastava. They presided over a young man who'd had a minor knee operation who got toxic shock syndrome and in the end died of raging septicemia. They presided over his decline, very obvious decline overnight, noting and observing the obvious signs of this extreme condition. And he died the following day. Um, and they were done for gross negligence manslaughter and convicted. Um, they were young Indian doctors from the subcontinent. They'd only recently arrived. One of them didn't have very good English. They'd been deprived of the access to the computer results from the blood test because they didn't have the right 
code or card or whatever it was they were required. Yeah, they were left, left entirely on their own overnight at the hospital. Um, they didn't have access to senior staff. And what's more, there was gross understaffing all around them. The fact is that doctor after doctor said that what they had observed, a first year medical student ought to have identified as extremely dangerous to this young man. And his death was altogether avoidable. Neither of them went to prison. One was struck off, but restored later. One was simply put under, I think, supervision. But you might be interested to know that the Southampton General Hospital Trust, whatever it's called, was taken to court as a trust and fined, I think, half a million pounds for their failures of um, providing those young doctors with the appropriate resources. So that was an example where the trust in a systems failure case, albeit with a lot of personal responsibility, I can't hide from that. Uh, systems failure case, the hospital were brought to book for it. And just on that topic, before I shut up about systems failure, I think there is a slight problem about systems failure. It, there has to be an element of personal responsibility where uh, healthcare professionals confront situations which they ought to recognize and ought to act upon. And the problem with the systems failure cry is that sometimes it seems to detract from the proposition that we all must be responsible uh, for our own bad mistakes, uh, with the obvious caveat that if those mistakes are caused or contributed to by systems which are quite beyond the individual's control, the law can and should reflect that fact. Yeah. But we come back to the same point I made earlier. What's really wrong at the moment is underfunding, understaffing, under-resourcing, and the lack of morale, which has been destroyed by successive. But didn't didn't your father say something about the importance of morale? Well, he was a proud founder member of the NHS. Mm -hmm. Despite his title and his distinction, he did very little private practice, uh, relatively speaking. He did quite a bit when he had four children in private education. But... Um, he said that the NHS, of which he was very proud, and its success and its function depended on the morale of the doctors and surgeons. And he used to say many years ago that if that morale was undermined or destroyed, the NHS had had it. And of course, I personally think um, that that is indeed one of the features of modern life in healthcare in this country. <laughs> Well, Kamal Shuka, thank you, Kamal, uh, for this. This is, this is uh, a comment, I think. It's ironic that in the era of bureaucratic over-regulation with appraisals, re-validation, WHO checklists, informed consents, that never events still happen on a regular basis. In fact, they seem to be increasing, proving the point that human errors are unavoidable. Uh, he says that's a real enigma. I mean... It, yeah. Uh, what, what's the difference? Somebody uh, earlier up uh, in the questions. Thank you, by the way, for questions. Do keep sending them in. They're really interesting to read. Um, somebody earlier on says, you know, what's the difference between uh, an error and, and, and negligent, a negligent error? I, I mean, is, is, can you differentiate between those? Because everybody makes errors. I, you know, I, I, I locked myself out of the house a few weeks ago, so that was an error. <laughs> Yes, I mean, the, the answer is, I, I did uh, um, explain it earlier. Uh, a mistake, an error is not negligent unless it is provenly on expert evidence, a mistake so bad that no reasonable doctor professing the relevant skill who is acting with ordinary skill and care would make. No a mistake. There's many mistakes which many of you will make daily which do not come into the category of negligence by any manner of means. You're having um, prospectively to make all kinds of judgments about the patient, about his condition, about what the best course will be, what his future is likely to be and so on. Making mistakes along the way is not negligent unless they are mistakes, which no reasonable doctor professing the relevant skill would make if acting with ordinary skill and care, not Olympian skill and care. You don't have to match up, unless you are an Olympian yourself, you don't have to match up to the optimum standards of the mm. top man in the field. Well, Richard Worth makes a point. He, you know, there's a lot of, of pressure from uh, particularly, well, a lot of doctors actually for a no blame culture. And, and the, the question is, is there any real prospect this being established in the NHS? But I suppose you would argue that a no blame culture allows negligent mistakes to go 
uh, un, uncontested. Would you? Would you agree with that? I, I think above all, I would say this about it. That first of all, it's unworkable in a country as big and sophisticated and uh, with so many population as ours. Uh, unless, as I say, I would have to advise a, uh, a patient paralyzed by an extremely careless knife of the surgeon, uh, that I'm very sorry that you should have got run over by a careless driver. Mm. I don't want to have to say that. Our society expects everybody to conform to certain standards in their practices. The architect, the crane driver, the pilot, the lawyer, we all have to meet reasonable standards of skill and care. Yeah. And, and to exempt the, the healthcare professionals who, after all, can, if their mistakes are bad enough, cause some pretty ghastly outcomes, to exempt them from it would seem a very extreme step indeed. It would also remove the incentives, the best incentives to uh, um, risk management and risk avoidance, the best incentives to the best possible care, uh, the, the best arguments for, well, let me, let me just put it this way. In the Victorian times, there were appalling evils to which uh, factory workers and other employees were subject. Tort law, the law of negligence, had a very big part to play in bringing about a climate in which care for those who might be harmed if dangerous practices continue becomes a priority. And um, we know that the howling of politicians against the lawyers about the damages claims as I've suggested, is totally misdirected. They should direct this at the proper funding and resourcing of the health service. Um, but, but, but the fact is that risk management has been hugely advanced by the problems that litigation uh, brings in terms of cost and time and energy. Yeah. Mike Simmons got an interesting question here. Duty of candor that you've already mentioned, uh, James, can cause problems, he says. When should one report an issue to a patient if no actual harm has occurred? Um, is, is that just going to cause the, the patient um, anxiety? He knows there's been a mistake, but he's, he's still OK or she's still OK. But should, should the patient be told about errors if, they have, if, if no harm comes from it? Well, I don't know that I... <laughs> Common sense is generally the view that yeah. the law takes, believe it or not. Right. Common, common sense would say, of course, you don't need to, provided that no harm really came of it. Um, I mean, I, I, in my career as a lawyer, I've made umpteen mistakes, most of which I can rectify, recognize, rectify, and salvage. And yeah. many, of which, many of which were too trivial to make any real difference to the outcome for my clients. I wouldn't dream of worrying my client about silly mistakes that I've made if they didn't have a bad effect. And I don't think the law would ever require you to. It'd be a very silly judge, wouldn't it, who said, oh, you ought to have told them about that mistake you made, even though not, no harm resulted. What would be the purpose of that? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Well, Jonathan Kay says, uh, I don't understand this question myself, but maybe you do. How quickly will we move to a Bolitho style standard of what's expected of practitioners? Do, do you know what a Bolitho style standard well, i mean the answer is bolitho mitigated or modified the bolam test somewhat the bolam test says provided any doctors a body of doctors can be found to defend and support and sanction what was done or not done which mm. says was negligent and which by definition caused injury provided a body of doctors can be found to support it there's no negligence and the claim can't succeed but, yeah, but as i said you can always dredge up in the old days they used to dredge up dinosaurs Man and boy, I've done it that way, they would say, even though it's all moved on and 98% of the profession would disagree and say it should be done a different way. So Belitha came along and said, well, that is the end of any negligence claim if, if a body of doctors that's a reasonable body will support it or sanction it, provided that their proposition meets with logical analysis. And in that regard, could I tell you about the case that's most scarred on myself? Sure. My, my, my client was a desperately brain damaged baby who had gone to term perfectly normal and was healthy and should have been born as a healthy child. During the caesarean section, which had to be performed because of the mother's condition, um, as the obstetrician was lifting the baby out by its feet, her feet, the womb went into a, a muscular spasm. It, it's a very rare but known phenomenon. 
around the after coming head and neck. The head and neck was thus trapped within the womb. And while the cord was out and trapped and the head within, the baby was asphyxiating. Um, the, the, the experts for the claimant, my client, plaintiff then called, said, all you need to do then is make a short vertical incision at right angles to the original transverse one, thus a T-shaped incision. It, it cuts through the muscular spasm of the uterus and the baby is instantly lifted out and saved from either brain damage or death, which is going to result. Instead of which the obstetrician just waited. He knew the spasm would eventually, uh, uh, what's the word, relax. So he just waited and waited and waited while the baby was head was within the womb with the, with the spasm around its neck until eventually it relaxed and then he lifted out by which time it was very nearly dead and has had a lifetime. I've been to see her recently, she's 30 something years old. A lifetime of total immobility, can't speak, can't eat, but needs care all the time from her parents. Yeah. The, the, the experts for the defense were two obstetricians. I think they were professors and they both came, I think, from guys. They quoted from an old textbook called McGillivray, which said that this T-shaped incision to rescue the baby in this circumstance is what he called an unacceptable mutilation, which mm. threatened the mother's future fertility. They both said that meant they should, the, 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 the obstetrician was perfectly entitled just to wait and wait and wait and wait and never make that little vertical decision. They said it might threaten her future fertility, to which I said in court, well, excuse my language, but bother her future fertility. This was a live, normal, happy, healthy infant that could have been born all right with a second's work, with a quick cut. But the judge said, well, two professors have said it should never be done. And there's a textbook that says it should never be done. That's the end of it, Bolan. But Litho nowadays, which came long after that case, would have said the judge should have applied logic to that defense argument, however distinguished those professors were. And Belitho says the judge applies logical analysis to a defense argument. And if it doesn't add up in his mind, as that one shouldn't have done, obviously not, um, uh, then he, he rejects the defense and is entitled to. Yeah. There's a, there's a question about le the legal minefield around euthanasia, uh, but I also wanted to talk about Hong Kong. You, you've been involved now with, with the legal uh, profession in Hong Kong, which is, of course, quite interesting with the Chinese um, gradually clamping down on Hong Kong. What, what, what's going on there, James? What, 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 um, well, legally? the first thing to say is that, that when the handover occurred, it was in 1989, the English legal system was guaranteed for 50 years. And the English legal system is valuable to the Chinese as they become ever more capitalist, of course, because English law is generally specified in all commercial contracts all around the world, even between, say, Brazil and Sierra Leone. English contract law and commercial law is what tends to be used. So it's a very valuable resource. Uh, what's happened, uh, of course, in, uh, lately is the introduction of the security law, which is designed to suppress um, dissent effectively. And, and that's um, led to great concerns, obviously. But uh, rest assured at the moment, the English legal system remains in force in Hong Kong. Um, what the future holds, I, I, I just simply don't know. But at the moment, the inroad on what we think of as, as our law is in that particular statute, which is designed to to, to tackle those that disagree with the mainland government. Uh, and and um, pe people are concerned, obviously, for the future of the English legal system there for that reason. And how, how much work do you, are you, are you still doing work for, for the, in Hong Kong now? Well, I, I've done a number of cases there over the years, including in the Court of Final Appeal there, um, where there's always an English uh, Supreme Court judge who sits there, and they still do some of them. Um, and I'm, but I've retired from active practice. I, I, I've taken my wig off, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> but I'm now a visiting professor at the university there at the Centre for Medical Ethics and Law. So I still have a role to play. I start my Zoom lecturing uh, next week. Right. And I hope to go on playing a part in it and that the English legal system will survive. 
But yeah, I hope so too. So Sophie, a nice question from Sophie Lindsay. She asked this much earlier, actually. Thank you, Sophie. For, and she says, hi, James. What, what advice would you give to an aspiring clinical negligence lawyer to make their application stand out? And as a sort of corollary to that is, I mean, I think doctors are, t- are really intro interested in the law we're all, all actually basically terrified of it but we also you know have great admiration for you chaps that have to stand up in court and sound so um so eloquent uh often you know looking at a brief uh the night before and and then kind of making a summary of it and then being able to uh enunciate the whole thing to encapsulate it in in, in a way that people can understand i mean that's a skill that that doctors don't really have I mean, so so. What advice would you give to Sophie for for to stand out um, uh, for an aspiring clinical? She maybe she wants to be a QC or maybe even a judge. What 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 would you say to her? Well, I mean, I think the the, the difficulty is that the, the field of clinical negligence practice in the law is a relatively small one, and yeah. and, and it's I think I don't mind using the expression. It, it's clinical negligence and medical law is considered a rather sexy subject. So there are a lot of people who would like to get into the field and, and do it. So the first thing is you have to apply to the chambers that do the work and they're relatively small in number. And the second thing is you're going to have to compete obviously with a lot of very highly qualified people. Um, in which regard, can I mention one thing? Uh, there was a great concern that the bar was kind of a privileged elite who had private money behind them. Uh, uh, when I started at the bar, it was difficult to make a living at first, and so to an extent, it was true that those with a bit of money from family money were the ones who could do it and survive. But when I joined my chambers, it then had about 17 or 18 members. We had seven or eight pupils. Um, you were supposed to pay your pupil master in those days. You didn't actually pay them, but that was technically it. Um, in order to widen access to the bar, it was decided we should pay our pupils out of the collective pocket of chambers. And our pupils now get paid, I think it's £70,000 for a year to be a pupil when they're learning. Um, and some chambers uh, pay more. So you can imagine the competition that's going on. In fact, um, instead of widening access to the bar, making us pay, pay people has grossly narrowed it. Right. The number of pupilages on offer has been reduced, obviously, and Oxford dons apply for these pupilages now because they get paid more as a pupil than they do as a don at Oxford. <laughs> um, so you need to stand out in some way or other. Ideally, you want to have shown a great interest in the ethical and, and even scientific issues of medicine and the law relating to medicine. You need to have a good academic record, obviously. And you need to, ideally, I think, and this is my opinion, I was in charge of pupillage, you need to have a variety, of, wide variety of interests and activities beyond academic to show mm. for your you know, early career. I think, I think uh, Sophie will appreciate that answer. Let, let me ask you a question then, James. I mean, you, you, you could have been a judge. Um, you decided not to be a judge, uh, you were telling me earlier. Why, why did you make that decision? Because sitting up there on the, uh, on the bench with a nice, um, nice wig on um, would, would suit you, it seems to me. Why did you, why did you turn that offer down? Well, I, I was a Deputy High Court Judge. I was a recorder in the Crown Court. I was a, a President of the Mental Health Review Tribunal. I did uh, do judging work. It was always part time, of course. Um, and I enjoyed it as a variety or a change of scene. But to be perfectly frank with you, to sit all day, every day of my life in a courtroom, in the old days when I had my chances, guarded from the IRA, never allowed to take the same route home every night, and the High Court judge has to live in lodgings half the year around the country, away from home, away from his wife and family. And what's more, the job has become harder and harder and harder in the sense that every detail of your judgments is poured over. In the old days, a judge would give a decision from what he thought was the right answer. And if he was appealed, the Court of Appeal would say, well, he didn't say this, he didn't say that, but I'm sure he was very experienced. I'm sure it was all in his mind. Not so now. So you not only spend night after night reading hundreds and thousands of pages, you then write judgments interminably, which are poured over by clever dicks who want to prove you wrong in the Court of Appeal. And you lead a very limited and enclosed life in the court, mm-hmm. away from the cut and thrust of advocacy, away from the variety 
that the bar brings to you. I could be a judge sometimes and an advocate other times. I could go to Hong Kong and do cases. Uh, I would have been a very narrow life and a very hard life. And I just knew myself too well. I knew I would be essentially miserable as some people who take mm. the job often because the knighthood is so attractive. So, so a number of them find themselves utterly miserable when they uh, mm. take the job. Yeah. So although it appears to be the acme of all desire, and the title is often desired by some people, because the High Court Judgeship brings a knighthood automatically. What's the best thing about being a QC? Is it winning some fantastic case, or and then the, the check that comes in the post as a result of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been well paid. I haven't been one of those fat cats that the press always love talking about. Hmm. And a vast amount of my work over the years with legal aid, which is not fat cat stuff. Yeah. I think there are two things. I come from a professional family almost entirely medical on both sides. And I was brought up to the sense that, um, what's the expression, much is asked of those to whom much is given. And being able to help people in trouble and do something which I, in the end of the day, felt was worthwhile, uh, was a big reward. The other thing was, although I'm not in love with the law, I have a strong sense of justice and fairness, and I was able a bit as a silk QC to have an impact on the law and to change some features of it. And well, after all, that Montgomery case was a huge change. And I, I should add, by the way, that the patient-centered test, which Montgomery represents, uh, arrived in this country last of barely all our Western countries. The Americans, the Canadians, most Europeans have been way, way ahead of us with the Montgomery principle. Yeah. We were almost last in the queue to come there. But um, Bolam, Bolam survives, of course, for, for decisions about diagnosis and treatment. In other words, if you can find doctors to defend and sanction what you did, you're not negligent. Mm -hmm. but, but consent is the patient's decision. It's not like diagnosis and treatment, which is your specialist skill derived from your knowledge and other doctors. Yeah. Can judge. Yeah. Um, consent is the patient's decision. And I always felt strongly that that didn't, Berlin didn't really belong in that. And yeah. just because a couple of doctors think it's fair enough not to tell a patient anything about risks at all, doesn't, in my view, necessarily make it right not to tell a patient about any risk or anything at all. So do you think the Montgomery case, was that your finest hour? Or what was your finest hour? Um, I, I, in the early days, when I first started doing this work, I, I, had, I had a bit of a role in in changing some of the practices and getting uh, getting greater fairness and justice. Um, in the old days, the defense didn't have to supply their medical reports at all. You didn't know what the defense was. They could just simply plead negligence is denied and you'd arrive at court having no idea what they were going to say. Uh, medical experts were very hard to come by to act for claimants in the old, old days. The closing ranks was the norm and they wouldn't. Uh, I had some effect on that. I fought battles sometimes with experts that I considered to be biased, prejudiced, or how can I put it, <laughs> not totally necessarily straight. Mm. Um, and I have made a difference. I think that's what I feel really, that it was a life in which I was able to make a difference to the lives of some people who were really in tremendous difficulty and whose lives had been shattered. Yeah. Um, and that was a bit like my father and all my relatives who helped people who were sick. Well, that's a, that's a good way to wrap up. And I, we should also give a plug for Mary, your wife, and Rory and William and Isabel, your kids, who uh, uh, you're very proud of and uh, are uh, a great reflection of your, your, your own skills and ability. So don't go away, James. I've got a couple of announcements to make. I'm, uh, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I'm sorry I didn't get to, to answer all of your questions. We had about 30 or 40 of them. Uh, we got through quite a few. So next week, we've got very, another interesting guest, and I'm doing the interview again. It's uh, Lord Bernie Ribeiro, who's the, um, the only black uh, president of the Royal College of Surgeons. Actually, was one of my teachers when I was a medical student at the Middlesex Hospital many years ago. Uh, so he's a sort of a friend, as well as uh, a great example of uh, a top surgeon. Um, and the following day, on, on the Thursday, that's Wednesday, on the following day, we've got uh, Professor Callum Semple, who's just written a very interesting paper about um, COVID infections in hospital. We didn't get to cover COVID and the medico-legal aspects of that in this program, although there was a question, but we'll be talking about that on Thursday lunchtime. Um, uh, just also a, a plug for in September, 
we've got an extended Thursday afternoon program talking about vaccinations, very controversial, whether we should have a booster jab, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, finally, uh, the RSM has been um, affected financially by COVID because our building's been closed. So if people have enjoyed this session and would like us to continue with them, if they would like to make a donation to the uh, RSM, uh, the, the request comes up after the program We'd gratefully receive that. So, James, thank you so much. We'll let you, you go back to, uh, I was going to ask you about herons as well, but we've run out of time. Uh, you live uh, in Barnes, not far from uh, a, a reservoir there, where I'm sure there are lots of wonderful birds to see. Um, we'll have to get you back to answer, ask you more questions because we ran out of time. But thank you so much, James. Uh, and regards to your, your uh, cousin, David, uh, and to the rest of the family and your kids and, and marry your wife as well. Good night, everybody. And good night, James. Bye.